Hi, it's Wednesday, November the 2nd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the church in Rome. At least I do so for another couple of days. Uh, today, tomorrow, the next day, that'll end the week. That'll end basically the letter to the Romans. And so next week I will start with uh, Corinthians. Um, but for now, we're in Romans. And we're finishing up Romans 15. Today it's verses 22 to 33. Yesterday, Paul was telling us that he is called specifically to the Gentiles, uh, not to build on the foundation uh, of anybody else, but to to start new. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, I, I wondered a little bit about why Paul would be called to that. I wondered a little bit about privilege. Um, but Paul picks that up and basically explains that, well, the reason he's telling um, the, the church in Rome that he's been called to the Gentiles is to explain why he hasn't seen them yet, because that's where we pick it up. So it's Romans 15, 22 to 33. This is the reason that I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain. For I do hope to see you on my journey and be sent on by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. They were pleased to do this, and indeed they owe it to them, for, for if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material things. So when I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will set out, my way, I will set out by way of you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in earnest prayer to God on my behalf, that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. The God of peace be with all of you. Amen. So there we go. Feels like the end of the letter, doesn't it? But that's Paul. He likes to end things a few times. Um, yeah, never quite finished. Paul would make a very good Canadian. <clears throat> we joke about Canadians. We never seem to say goodbye very well. We say goodbye, you know, in the living room. And then we go to the door and we say goodbye at the door. And then we walk out. We walk you out to the car. Uh, and then we stop, stop at the car and we say goodbye to you at the car. And then you get in the car, roll down your window, and we keep saying goodbye for a while. <clears throat> Pretty soon, 40 minutes have passed. Um, <laughs> and um, it feels like Paul does that too. Paul says goodbye. Paul says we're done. And then Paul has a little more to say, a little more to say, a little more to say. Uh, and we'll hear about a little more um, tomorrow. But for now, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, the words are pretty straightforward. Um, I mean, Paul has basically said, yeah, I've been called to the Gentiles, which is why I haven't come to see you yet. But now I'm looking forward to it because I am, I'm going to go to Spain, but on the way I will come to see you. So Paul, again, is being called um, to, to, to broaden the, uh, the reach of, of, of this ministry. Uh, we're going to go into new uncharted grounds in, in, in Spain and beyond. But along the way, Paul says, I, I will, I'll stop to see you. Um, but first, he says, but first, I am going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Lovely flowery words. What Paul means is he's got money, um, basically, um, from Macedonia and Achaia. Um, Macedonia and Greece, and he's bringing it to, to Jerusalem. Paul's journeys are very often that, collecting resources, collecting money, and bringing them back to, to the church um, in, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, it does make me wonder about um, the relationship that, that, that faith has to, to resources. The relationship that the um, institutional the institution, uh, the institutional church, the institutional community, the relation that it has also to fundraising. That's what Paul's doing, essentially, is fundraising. I mean, he even sort of puts it there quite simply. They were pleased to do this. Indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they also ought to be of service to them in material things. So you appreciate what we're offering you, so you kind of should pay for it. 
I, I struggle, a lot of my colleagues, I think, struggle um, with this idea of paying for spiritual blessings, for engagement, for facilitation. Um, many of my colleagues, I mean, we think that we should be able to just give what we have to people in need. We should give it freely. We should invite people in. Um, but there's a couple of things that, that we have to struggle with, and that is, you know, um, maintaining our institution in a safe place, in a safe way. So if we have a church building, it is a fair expectation for people coming into it that they will be safe, right? That the building will be in good repair. Uh, therefore, we need to have staff who help do that. We have staff who help facilitate your your coming and going in this place. Um, and uh, we have we have ministry staff, pe people like me, ministers, um, who we would like them to be able to live in the community, to be part of the community. Therefore, they need to have an income too, which is sort of similar to the income of the people in the neighborhood. Um uh, so that they can live in their presence. And, you know, so all of these things cost money. And who is to pay for those things? Well, we say to ourselves, well, the, the, the people who are using, who are using the resources should be paying for it. But the problem with that then is that if you can't pay, you don't get the resources. So then we end up sort of saying, okay, so... For those who have the gift of wealth, they should share that gift. And those who have other gifts should share their gifts. And those who have their needs should not be ashamed of their needs. So if they need spiritual guidance, they should be able to come freely. If they need financial support, they should come freely. If they need what we have but can't pay for it, they should come freely. The challenge in that, though, is recognizing this as a ministry, not an institution. And... Where I live, in the time that I live, the language we have and the tools that we have tend to be business tools. And so we, we engage in our religious institutions as if they're businesses. We want to make them sustainable. But really, long-term sustainability means profit now that we can bank and put aside. Uh, I, I am part of a church uh, that has... Um, a, a nest egg, and we count on the interest of, 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 of that invested money. Uh, it is important to us. Uh, it allows us to pay for staff and maintain a building and run programs and do all those things that we think that, that God is asking us to do. Um, but we seem to have forgotten that there was enough manna for one day, and we weren't meant to store it up. I remember reading that. Uh, we seem to forget, you know, that, that Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow. We seem to forget um, that, you know, the lilies in the field, um, you know, and, 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 and God takes care of them. Um, and I don't sort of point an accusatory finger um, because, by the way, I also invest in a pension, so I am thinking about 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 the future for, for myself. I'm not just leaving it all to, well, it'll be okay. God will take care of me. But I struggle with that. And, and at the very least, I think I can stop worshiping the business of church. At least I can dare to risk as opposed to become risk adverse uh, in an effort to be what I think is sustainable, because I want to—I—I—I I, I want to run the church as at, at a profit. Um, Paul very clearly here is going around collecting money, bringing it back to the church in Jerusalem. We are building the institution, um, and now he says share the resources with the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So we could look at this and say, what Paul is doing is collecting money, but he's sharing it with those who don't have money. The thing is that in Jerusalem, there were all sorts of different types of people. Uh, and, and there were institutions that needed to be, uh, to be um, financed. So it wasn't just taking money from rich Macedonians and giving it to hungry, poor people in Jerusalem. Um, it was a matter of bringing funds in that we might be an institution together. Um, and there are institutional costs. 
every church has a history somewhere along the way uh, of, of, of raising money. Um, I don't know of any great church that lived off the collection plate, um, what people gave freely. Uh, they were also always, to this day, running events, fundraising events, inviting people in that they might raise money to do their, their good works. Um, and I recognize that 2,000 years ago, Paul was doing exactly that. But, but the fact is, he talks about the poor uh, in this. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share the resources with the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So even as we collect money for the institution, we don't forget what the institution is about. And I think that's always the challenge. Um, yeah. Because we don't want to end up with an equation that says, if you get our spiritual blessings, you should be paying for them. We want them to provide to everybody. So it is important, I think, for the whole community to recognize a ministry and to give as we can to that ministry. Not to give what's fair, not to give the, you know, the appropriate amount. Well, I come to church this often, so I should be paying that much. No, no. How much do you believe in this ministry and what it is doing and invest in that appropriately, whether you come or not? My church supports uh, a, a digital ministry, an online community called Resistance Church. And my partner, Brianne, uh, is primarily responsible for, for pastoring, maintaining, building that, that community. It's a small-ish community, like we're talking in the dozens, not in the hundreds. Um, but it is largely of people who have, who have um, been betrayed by church, or have been hurt by church, or who are so churched up themselves that they don't have time. So there are, in fact, there are some um, uh, clergy type who are who are part of this part of this group. And there are times that there are people in my community uh, who like to gather in person when they can and like the digital stuff that we do, but aren't part of Resistance Church because that name just I don't know. Uh, and they'll go like, so are we getting our money back? On this, are we making money from this? They'll they'll wonder, and and you have and, and I have to remind them that we have a ministry to people who have a spiritual need, and it's not about whether or not they can pay for it. It's the fact that they have a need, and we can help meet it. This is a ministry God calls us to. Uh, we don't sit at somebody's deathbed and sort of calculate. Well, I don't know how much money they've given to the church in the past. I'm not sure how long I'm supposed to stay here. How, how, how many prayers should I offer if they, if they gave $5,000 last year? How many prayers should I offer if they, if they gave $5 last year? Is, is it supposed to be different? And when I share that with people, they go, oh, of course not. No, it shouldn't be. To, no, you, you should be praying for them. Well, that's because as a community, we recognize we have a ministry together, right? And it's not about who can pay and how much they can pay. And it's not about the business model. But when we sit down in board meetings, it's really hard not to go and fall on our business experience. Paul gets it. Paul lives in this tension too. The Gentiles have come to share their spiritual blessings. They also ought to be of service to them in material things. He says it. They're getting the stuff. They ought to be paying for the stuff. But he also says in the sentence that preceded that, that they are pleased to share the resources with the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. We live in that tension. Anyway, maybe that's just, that's a thing for me. Maybe that's just a, um, a wondering that, that, that it's very, <laughs> very specific to, to clergy or, or to me. Um, as I go through the passage, a couple other things sort of leap out at me. Uh, I like that Paul says, join me in earnest prayer to God on my behalf. Um, He's asking them to pray for him. And I find these days, these are words that we use easily. People say, you know, Reverend, will you please pray for me? Norm, will you please pray for me? Uh, and we'll sometimes say to people, oh, please pray for me. And we often say it like, well, we, got, we don't know what else to say, so we might as well just say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll pray for you. Um, I now try to be very conscious about that. When I say that I'm going to pray for somebody, I actually write their name down so I don't forget. And I and I pray for them. Sometimes I pray for them in the moment, but sometimes I pray for them as part of sort of my prayer discipline. Um, 
when I sit and talk with God. Um, I will, I will bring up their names and I will bring them to God because I think prayer matters. And I know that Paul thinks prayer matters because he's asking them to do it for him. Right? We can forget this, but 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 Paul was was being um, stalked, as it were, by uh, by Jewish Christians who felt that he was doing. No, by, excuse me, by 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 zealous um, Jews who felt that he was uh, a blasphemer and doing and doing bad things. Uh, and even if Paul went to a community where he was well accepted, they would often tag along, show up the next day, and do some rabble rousing and turn the crowd against Paul, making it difficult for Paul. So Paul has these people dogging him, and he knows because he used to be one of those people, um, and, and and so he's asking for prayer. So this is this is hard for him, and so he's asking people to pray um, to make it better for him so that he can do his ministry. So Paul believes in prayer, and and I I like that. It 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 reminds me of the importance of prayer. I read, you know, I read Jacob. Uh, I, I mean, I read through the Hebrew scriptures. I read about Jacob. I read about Esau. I I don't know how much prayer matters to them. I read Noah. I don't know how much prayer matters to them. Um, but I read this, and Paul says, "Yeah, please, please pray for me." And uh, join me in earnest prayers to God on my behalf. Please pray for me. I was talking with a couple of people the other day uh, about, about praying for, for our enemies. Um, and, and Jesus asks us to do that and, and, and how we were supposed to do that. And I, as we were talking, I remembered a couple of times when I have been at loggerheads with with uh with a with a christian who has a, a very different perspective um i mean i think that they're completely wrong and they think that i'm completely wrong um and so you know sometimes you'll say yeah well you know what i'll pray for you which basically means i think that you're ignorant and i will pray that you get smart one day and that really just adds to the tension and you know it's 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 like, it's a it's like slamming the door i'll pray for you but there are a couple of times when I have been in disagreement and I have, I have said to the other person sincerely, I will pray for you and I hope that you will please pray for me. And what I have meant is I, I, I hope that, that we will hold each other up before God, that we'll hold each other up in love, even if we can't disagree on, our, even if we can't, we can't agree on our theology even if we can't agree on our, on the application of our theology, which is the way we live our faith. Um, but I, I, I sincerely will pray for that person and hope that they pray for me. So it's not that I'm hoping that they become like me. Uh, it's I'm hoping that we will find that place where, where God brings us together. Um, I believe in, in prayer. Uh, I just don't always act like I believe in prayer. And uh, yeah, Paul Paul's one of the people who reminds me that it's important to pray. And so when I'm really at loggerheads with somebody, I will pray for them. Not, not that they will wise up and be as smart as me. But I will pray for them that I might better understand them, that we might better understand each other, and that we might recognize each other as children of of God, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, that felt like a bit of free advice I just gave you, and I didn't mean to do that. But anyway, um, prayers matters to me. The other thing that made me wonder, I suppose, uh, it's right after that he says um, uh, that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea. That's part of what we're praying for, and. Yes, he was being uh, dogged by people. Uh, and, uh, and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So Paul is praying that the church in Jerusalem, which is sort of the, the mother church, as it were, um, that it appreciate his ministry. That my ministry in Jerusalem to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. The saints are the people of the church. I don't know how many 
uh, I honestly don't know how, how, how many of my colleagues pray that their congregation, that their ministry will be acceptable to their congregations. I like to think that lots of us do, but there are days that I suspect that few of us do. Uh, I often listen to colleagues who um, who feel that, oh my gosh, they have to put up another, another day with, with, with a congregation that are slow to understand. Uh, they are weak in spirit, poor in imagination, <clears throat> and, and frankly, they're getting frustrated with, uh, with their people who just don't get it. And I find a certain arrogance in that. And maybe it, maybe it bothers me because I have been that way uh, and I can fall into that still. And so maybe that's why it really bothers me. But, but the arrogance of suggesting that I know everything and if only those people would get it. Uh, I would suggest to you that Paul's difficulty here is his ministry is to the Gentiles. Um, <clears throat> and, and in Jerusalem, we're fairly conservative. We're largely Jewish Christians. Uh, and um, yeah, may not be so sure about all the things that Paul is saying um, and, and may not appreciate that. And Paul is praying that his ministry might be acceptable to them. Not that they would get with the program and understand it, that they would understand his ministry because clearly he's right, but that there may be an acceptance, that there may be a coming together, that they might hear what I am saying and, they, and that they might appreciate it. I like that Paul humbles himself. He recognizes that the community in Jerusalem, his church community, are not foolish people waiting to be enlightened. Uh, we're in this together and we need to be listening to each other. So he hopes that, Jer that, the, 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 that the saints in Jerusalem will be listening to him. But in that, I believe that he's also indicating that he is willing to listen to them. He wants his ministry to be acceptable to them. I think Paul is, is, is willing to learn from the community. And I think that's always a challenge. You know, for those of us, um, for those of us who, who, who describe our lives as faithful, I mean, very often we, we, we search about until we find a faith community that matches our faith. We rarely go to one that doesn't really quite match our faith with the idea that, well, I'm going to learn from these people and see where it takes me. No, no, I'm going to go to where I'm comfortable. And, and, and why wouldn't you? Of course you would. Um, I mean, I do. And, and by the way, there are some Christian communities that are abhorrent to me. I can't, I can't abide what they do. But it is a value to me to recognize that we are a large community and, and that I can learn something from people with whom I do not always agree. I think it's always worthwhile to let go of some of the arrogance, get off of the high horse uh, and... And humble. It's important for me to humble myself from time to time uh, in front of the community that I serve. That I might learn from them. That I might strive to make my ministry acceptable to them. Not let them dictate everything. We learn from each other and I am called to lead. But at the same time, I'm also called to learn and to follow. Oh, leading, following teaching, learning. <sighs> yeah. The more I do this, the more I recognize that there is a tension always in ministry. Uh, and I think recognizing that um, brings a sense of, 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 of peace. And when I say ministry, I mean basically a life of faith. We're all in ministry. Whether, whether your paycheck says that you're paid to be faithful or not, we are all in a ministry. So, so this, this ministry we have or this life of faith we have, there's always a certain tension in it, but it can be a creative tension and it can be a beautiful tension. We just have to recognize that there's sometimes, no, that there's always a certain tension. Anyway, I'm rambling, so I'm going to stop now and just leave this with you and see what you make of it for the day. So with that, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, we thank you. We thank you for the rest in the midst of tension. We thank you for the gifts that, that come in this day and age, but also the gifts that have been with us always. 
And we ask God to find that space between where we bring business principles, but also bring radical love into our ministry that we might do it effectively in community. And God, when we do ministry in community, when we live faithfully in community, even if it's just to gather to wonder, may we listen to each other. May we learn from each other. We pray in the name of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with that, my friends, I... Uh, <laughs> I apologize. My screen just went blank. I, I am so glad to get... I'll be so glad to get my equipment back next week. Um, I don't even know how to fix this right now. Oh, bless us. Uh, anyway, I look forward to, to uh, catching up with you. Um, yeah, tomorrow. Until I get to see you. I hope you're less confused than I am. My screen is literally blocking me out right now. It will not let me in. Oh, my goodness. This is just, just this crazy talk. Um, yeah, whatever you do today, please, please know that you are, that you are blessed. Um, please know that God sees you exactly as you are and where you are. And please know that God's love moves through you into the world in ways you can, you can't even imagine. Please know that. Please know that you're blessed. And please, let me find a way to finally <laughs> sign out. Uh, until we see each other again. God bless you. We'll see you soon.